Last week, I shared some directives issued by Jesus. They were clear, precise, simple, straightforward. For example, in John chapter 2, Jesus said to the servants at the wedding regarding those stone water jars, fill them with water. That was clear instruction. And the servants obeyed. To Nicodemus, the respected teacher who came to Jesus that night, he said, believe in God's one and only Son, and you shall not perish. Also, clear and direct. To the woman at the well, he said, give me a drink. And then to the man who had been paralyzed for some 38 years, he said, pick up your pallet and walk. These are all simple and direct commands or directives issued from the lips of Jesus. And I pointed out this truth. Miracles don't happen until someone obeys God. The Red Sea didn't part until Moses had led the Israelites right to the shoreline. There was no water to drink from the rock until Moses struck it with his staff. The manna from heaven was worthless until the Israelites stooped to pick it up. Miracles aren't realized until someone obeys God. In John chapter 6, Jesus gives yet another clear and simple directive. He told his disciples, have the people sit down. Nothing unclear in that command. Yet, don't you see, had the disciples or the people present that day not obeyed, they would have missed a miracle and a meal. Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. They followed Jesus because they saw him heal the sick and do other miracles. Did you notice that John calls these miracles signs? The miraculous things Jesus did signaled to anyone paying attention that Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah, the Christ, the Promised One. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. They saw the miraculous signs he had been doing, healing the sick, and so now they followed him up on a mountainside. Apparently, no one thought to bring a lunch. No one, that is, except one little boy. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's that directive. Miracles happen if we obey God. When I was a boy myself, I always assumed that this boy in the Bible carried his lunch in a lunchbox just like mine. Do you remember your lunchbox? Mine was in the shape of a yellow school bus filled with Walt Disney characters. Mickey and Minnie were there, Donald and Daisy, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie, too. They were all on the bus. Chip and Dale and a whole host of other Disney characters were aboard. And you'll never guess who was driving that bus. Goofy. Who else? Anyway, at church when I heard the pastor preach a message from this passage of Scripture, that's the only lunchbox I knew. They must have been small loaves and fishes to all fit in that boy's lunchbox, I thought. And Jesus issued the directive, have the people sit down. You know what happened next. Jesus opened up that boy's lunchbox, removed his contents, gave thanks for what we were about to receive, and broke those five loaves and two fishes into bits. He proceeded then to feed 5,000 people. Scripture says they all got their fill. And then, just like my mother always used to do with leftovers, Jesus told his disciples to gather them all together and put them in the frigid air. <laughs> Keep them fresh until tomorrow, Jesus said. Let nothing be wasted. How many baskets full of leftovers were there? Twelve. There are so many lessons in this brief passage of Scripture, I suppose I should at least touch on them, even though this isn't really today's Bible lesson. But here they are, in brief... If anyone knew where to get food to feed that crowd of 5,000, it was Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, a town about nine miles away from where all this happened. But when Jesus asked Philip where they could buy enough bread to feed the crowd, Philip immediately started to assess the cost. We don't have enough money in the kitty to feed them even if they get one bite each, he said. 
I think Jesus wanted to teach his disciples and us that financial resources are never the true problem. Where's your faith? God will provide the resources you need to travel to Poland to sing with the singing men of Texas or whatever other financial need you may have at the moment. That just happens to be mine. I'm going to Poland in April to share my testimony and sing with the singing men of Texas. And think about this a minute. What if the boy had said, no, that's my lunch, hands off? My friends, if we offer nothing to God, he has nothing to use. Miracles won't happen until someone obeys God. Give what little you can to God and then watch him turn little into much. And look here, in performing miracles, Jesus' focus is always on people. If you think that crowd was odd when Jesus fed them with so little, just a few loaves and fishes, imagine what it did to the boy who shared his lunch that day. Interestingly, we never hear about him again, but I assure you, based upon what he saw that day, what Jesus did with the meager lunch he shared, that little boy was never the same again. Never the same again. Oh, I won't be the same again. From the moment I met Jesus, new life for me began, and I won't be the same again. You've heard that phrase, you can't outgive God? Well, that's because God takes whatever you give and multiplies it, magnifies it, amplifies it, and gives a portion of it right back to you. The rest of what you give, he uses to feed the kingdom. Listen, it is only those who are stingy with God who are blessed little. And that's what we learn from the loaves and fishes. But as I said, that's not our Bible lesson for today. Our lesson today is another directive Jesus gave us. He said, do the work of God. The story of the boy who gave up his lunch to feed 5,000 just sets up what happens next. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. As was his customary routine, in the confusion that generally follows when something extraordinary occurred, Jesus slipped away by himself. This time, not even his disciples knew where he went. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Let me stop right here and ask a question before I forget about it. John tells us that Jesus walked on water, but why should we believe him? Yes, I know it's the Bible, and we must believe what the Bible says, but suppose you were sitting across the table from a guy named John at some bistro in Capernaum the day after all this happened. You're enjoying a bowl of clam chowder, and this fellow named John sits down across from you, and he starts telling this incredible story about a man named Jesus who fed 5,000 people and that wasn't the end of it, because then he tells something even more incredible. This man walked on water. Right. Sure. You know, if you heard that from some guy in a bistro having lunch, I think you might consider changing tables. Why should you believe this man's testimony? He claims he saw this with his own two eyes. Why should any of us believe the incredible things John tells us? John witnessed these events, yes, but is that good enough? Would it hold up in a court of law? Well, the answer is no, not by itself. Our legal system is based upon one that God himself established millennia ago. When the Jews were still wandering in the wilderness, God gave them a standard by which a man's word may be established as truth. Through Moses, God said, a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. You ever wonder why we have four Gospels? Each basically tells the same story. Why four? Because a single testimony won't hold up in court. A matter is established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And my friends, we have four. And that is precisely why we can believe what John tells us. 
John tells us that a man once fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes. And now he tells us that one stormy evening, that same man went for a walk on water. There were 11 other disciples in the boat that night. They saw it too. All of them except one, a traitor named Judas, would be martyred or imprisoned for proclaiming this truth. Jesus is the Son of God. Twelve men saw what happened. Their testimony would hold up in a court of law. Jesus walked on water. Now, if you don't think that's quite incredible, please go down to a lake and try it out yourself. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The Sea of Galilee is 650 feet below sea level, 150 feet deep, and surrounded by hills. It's not a big lake, but sudden windstorms pop up there that can cause extremely high waves. When I was in Israel in 2011, I spent a night or two in Tiberias, the city on the shore of Lake Tiberias. One morning, I got up early and went down to the shore. I stuck my foot out flat right over the water. Then I put my weight on that foot. Guess what? It sank right to the bottom. I jerked it out again, but my shoe and sock still got wet. I discovered that I am unable to walk on water, but I had to try. I didn't know if I'd ever have another chance to walk across the Sea of Galilee. And that morning at breakfast, I was sitting across from people I didn't know all that well. I heard them remark how beautiful the view was from the hotel. And I said to them kind of casually, wait till you see the other side, it's gorgeous. They said, oh, have you been here before? And I said, no, but this morning I got up early and walked across the lake to see the other side. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it took them a minute to realize I was just kidding. Jesus walked on water. He crossed the Sea of Galilee on foot. It had never been done before and it hasn't been done again, not by anyone. And we aren't told how he did it. It's clearly a physical impossibility for a normal human being. Frankly, if it weren't for those 12 eyewitnesses who saw him do it, we'd have no evidence strong enough for us to believe it. But their testimony is enough to hold up in a court of law. Consider this. Jesus could have taken the land route. It would have taken him a little longer to walk around the lake instead of across it. Or he might have borrowed another boat. He could have asked any one of those 5,000 men he'd fed that day to row him across. I'm certain they'd have been glad to do it. It begs the question, why did Jesus walk across that lake? I know the answer. Why did Jesus cross the lake? To get to the other side. <laughs> Here they were, 11 disciples, in a boat three or four miles from shore. Jesus walked that distance across the lake on a stormy night. As he approached them, his disciples saw him. How did they react? John says they were frightened. Mark, in his gospel, says it more vividly. Mark tells us that they thought they saw a ghost. It was only after Jesus called out to them, assuring them, saying, It is I, don't be afraid. Only then were they willing to take him into the boat. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. When Jesus got into the boat, they were instantly transported to the other side. Next morning, when the crowd saw that neither he nor his disciples were there, they scrambled into boats themselves and set sail for Capernaum. They went looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Let's stop right here and ask ourselves a question. Why am I a Christian? Why are you following Jesus? Jesus criticized those who followed him only for what they could get out of it in this present life. You are looking for me only because you ate the loaves and fishes and had your fill, he said to them. Isn't that enough? 
Well, does following Jesus mean that he will always provide for us? Will God provide shelter and food and clothing and take care of all our needs? On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus promised this. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now listen, and this isn't just me saying this, it's Jesus. Jesus says it isn't adequate to be a follower of his just because you know he can take care of your physical needs. If you do, you've got your priorities set wrong. We Christians are to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The food that Jesus fed the people that day in Bethsaida nourished them only for a few hours. We have a God who meets our eternal needs. It is nice to know that our God cares enough to provide for us every day of our lives. He loves us that much. He provides food and shelter and clothes. He gives us money to buy the cars we need to drive around in and enough to take an occasional vacation. But if that was all God could do for us, he wouldn't be much of a God. God loved us so much more than merely enough to provide for our physical needs. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, many people stumble over this Bible verse because it doesn't make sense to them. They read, whoever believes in him shall not perish, and they scratch their heads. Really? People perish every day. Everybody since Adam and Eve have perished. My grandparents are perished. My mom and dad passed away decades ago. They all believed in Jesus, and guess what? They perished. They are dead and gone. And so, unbelievers don't understand why or how we can put our faith in a Bible verse that is so obviously wrong. But how is it wrong? It is wrong if you consider perishing only in the physical sense. Yes, we all die, but Jesus meant much more. He said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. We believers understand that these bodies of ours will die one day. We fill them with food that spoils, but we feed our spirits with food that endures to eternal life. Our friends and family may be sad when we pass from this life to death, but they will be comforted knowing that as Christians, we will see them again one day in heaven. For we know that to be absent from these tired old bodies of ours is to be present with the Lord. And so we Christians work not for food that spoil, food that merely meets the needs of these earthly bodies of ours. No, we work for something much more valuable for food that endures to eternal life. What kind of work is that? When Jesus told the people that day that they should be working for this food that does not spoil, they were naturally intrigued. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Many sincere seekers who wish to please God are puzzled about what he wants them to do. Jesus' reply was brief and simple. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Satisfying God does not come from any other work that we do, only by believing in the one who has finished the work for us. Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. Our sins are forgiven. We've been set free. The price was paid at Calvary. Our job, yours and mine, is to believe in the one who paid the price, the one God sent to do that work, his son Jesus. That is our work. That is the work of God that we are called to do. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Do the work of God. I'm Rich Musler, pastor of a very small church in Louisville, Texas. Thank you for studying the Bible with me today. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.